2,000 years ago, there was nothing here but this river, much wider then than it is now, meandering across a flood plain. But by the turn of the first millennium, around it had grown one of the most powerful and civilised centres in Britain, built and honed by three different invaders, each one with a distinct culture which created three different archaeologies. We're here in York to find out more about how the Romans, the Vikings and the Normans developed this famous and historic city, how they lived and how they died. This was the most ambitious project we'd ever tackled on Time Team. We had three days to look into three different sites spread right across this ancient city. And if that wasn't enough, we were doing it live. York's magnificent minster dominates the landscape. Our most recent site is close by, where we're going to be investigating what was the largest medieval hospital in the country. On the other side of the city, we hope to uncover a 9th century Viking street and find evidence of the traders who lived there. But we begin with a site that dates from the 1st century AD, when the Romans established the mighty fortress of Eber Arkham. Within 200 years, York had become one of the most influential outposts of the Roman Empire, and the home of two emperors, Septimius Severus and Constantius Chlorus. Outside the city walls, under the lawns of what's now the Royal York Hotel, we believe there's a huge Roman burial ground. Earlier digs by the railway station produced evidence of burials, but nobody knows how important this cemetery was. As usual, geophysics are first into action, and the results look promising. Well, there's this a nice high resistance linear coming through here. Well, like a rectangle, isn't yeah, it? Very clear, isn't it? Yeah, I, I guess that's probably going to be a wall or something like that. Right. That's my guess, anyway. Yeah. But look, on the, on the magnetic, same area, and you can see we've got these nice individual blob type things. Now, I'm wondering, are these burials? Only one way to find out, a five metre long trench here. And Phil can't wait to get his spade in. With a bit of help from some mechanical muscle and under the watchful eye of some newlyweds. You better not get in a trench, I don't think. I think you're not quite dressed for that, are you really? The trench descends. We know that burials extend out that way. Yeah. What we don't know is whether they extend down that way and just how far. <laughs> <laughs> Gives you permission to do. Helping me keep the archaeologists under control is garden doctor Paul Thompson. Why, why a burial site here though, Nick? The Romans never buried their dead in town. They always buried their dead on the edge of town. And we know from where the medieval walls are that that is the edge of where the Roman town was. And by lunchtime, the first Roman finds are emerging. Nick, you have shifted some stuff this morning, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, we've had a really good day. As you can see, we've taken down about a metre of modern topsoil and we're already down onto what we think is the surface of the natural subsoil. That's this yellow material that you can see under my feet. But what's particularly interesting is that we've got something cutting into the natural. You can see a change in the colour of the soil here, it's full of stones, and there's an edge coming round here, under my feet and back out the end of the dig. It looks very similar to the grave cuts that we found in the other excavation. That's exciting. Are we going to dig it, Phil? <laughs> well, of course we're going to dig it. I mean, the, the, the main thing is, this is not the only one we've got. We're going to give each one a number, we'll plan it, we'll put a digger into each of them, and we'll get them all out. And don't think the topsoil's been wasted. We've been getting some great finds out of them. I had in, no idea in, this had happened in, until this included, Including some coins. <laughs> oh, what you got? Well, what we've got here is a bronze coin of the Empress Helena. Now, she was the first wife of Constantius Chlorus. Chlorus means green, and we think it's because he got seasick. And there's actually a square in York called St. Helena Square, 
after this. This dig is going rather well, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what that, else have we got? That coin was struck by her adoring grandsons, and within the last few minutes, so uh, one of our metal detectors has come up with another coin, also struck by one of her grandsons, with a portrait of Constantius II, her grandson on it. So we're beginning to get a fourth century family portrait album. By the end of day one, we've got some rich finds, but we still don't know if the cemetery stretched this far. Early the next morning and more geophysics results, but John's not really sure what he's looking at. And at the moment, I still can't look at this set of results and say, well, that's Roman archaeology, that's a grave. I mean, could that be a stone building, maybe? It's possible, but it could be a garden feature. I need another trench, ideally going across that so I can see what it is. Where would that be on the ground and, and how big would you need to do it? Well, a seven by three across that and it's just over here. So our second trench opens up just a few yards closer to the hotel and nearer to the earlier burials. If geophysics are right, we might be onto anything from a Roman hotel to who knows what. Hey, Paul. What's that? It's a skull. Look. Wow, look at that. That yeah. is a human skull. That is outrageous. And it, it's in very, very good condition too. I mean, it, it, yes, so we got, this is, this is, we is it. This is burials. it. This is the burial. Nice one. Congratulations, so, yeah, guys. So we know so, the cemetery stands this way. Everything that comes out of the trench is sieved, washed and recorded. There's a lot of animal bone and pottery turning up in both trenches. Evidence may be of feasting. Well, here we've got a little bronze club, um, presumably of the god Hercules. I thought it was a big bloke. Well, this is just a very small club, and probably because it was worn either as an earring or it came from a little cult statuette. A trinket such as this would often be buried with its owner. How's it been going? To my untutored eye, that looks like a load of old concrete. Well, you're not quite right. Amazingly enough, right beneath the topsoil, we found the remains in situ of a, of a Roman building. How do you know that's Roman? Well, we've got two chunks of masonry right next to a piece of opisignum flooring, which we know to be Roman. What does that mean? Well, it's Roman concrete. They use it to make their floors. Within that, we've also got several pieces of Roman pottery. This is a base of a, a piece of pot used in funerary wear. We've also just found that the building had painted wall plaster. In our first trench, Margaret Cox has arrived with her osteoarchaeology team. I'll have to be careful getting in because we've got some pretty exciting archaeology here. Margaret, what have we got? <clears throat> well, we've, we've got an adult female skeleton running east-west. Uh, heads facing over towards the board there. And why do we have to wear these masks? We can't catch diseases. Well, so we don't contaminate the bones with our DNA from spit and sweat and hair and the usual things that fly around on archaeological sites. So later on we should be able to read their DNA? Yes, we should. Phil, what have you got? A bunch of old stones? It looks very much like that, Tony, but oftentimes you, they did actually put big boulders in and around a, a, a grave. But no bones yet? Oh, give me time! In Trench 2, Nick thinks that under the Roman rubble he'll find the foundations of a collapsed building. The trench is also beginning to look like a picnic site with oyster shells and chicken bones coming out. So would feasting have taken place at Roman funerals? The precise nature of the ceremony would depend on the tribal background of the people involved, but on the whole most people would be brought to the grave either in a coffin or laid on a bier and then they would be placed in the grave and there would be some sort of feasting or ceremony um, by the family and the mourners around the grave. Phil, you look like you've done really well. <laughs> well, I just keep going down and down and down, Tony. But what we can see is exactly how this burial's been put in. There is a wooden coffin. I know that because we've had coffin nails and the coffin has been laid into the grave over to one side and then you see these big stones have been rammed down by the side of it. So we've got an actual imprint of the coffin. And somewhere down there <laughs> is the individual that's in there. And what about this here, this body? This, this is incredible. Inside, one body, again with coffin nails. And, and Margaret, well, I can't stop her eulogising <laughs> about the quality of the yeah, skull. Uh, it's in wonderful condition. And we, we were beginning to worry because we weren't getting any bone in the sort of centre of the thorax. But actually, the, co the body seems to have slumped down and the arms are up on top for some reason. Can 
Can we identify what sort of use that glass might have been put to? It's not very easy, but I think it's probably been um, a drinking vessel again. It's quite thin glass. So once again, this rather Latin idea of people sitting around amongst the dead bodies, yes. feasting and enjoying themselves. Yes. So this square bottle would have contained wine, water, or even embalming oils. In fact, it was the Romans who introduced glass blowing to Britain and would have built kilns to reach temperatures of 1,200 degrees centigrade. We built and fired a brick kiln in the Roman style and Paul was on hand to see the process through. What are we going to try and make with it? Well, we've got this fragment which was found in York. It's Beautiful. the rim of a jug and this is what it would have looked like with its ovoid body and its trail and Mark's going to try and reproduce this for us. That looks very beautiful but also very, very complicated to me. Wow. What are you doing to it at the moment? OK, I'm just shaping it and cooling it down slightly prior to blowing the initial bubble. And now I'm going to just, just cut in here. This ensures that the, the neck is relatively thin. That's a technique known as thumbing out, and I'm just uh, trapping some well, air in the yeah, blowing yeah, iron. You can see the air in there now. What's that you're doing? Just keep it under <laughs> control. I'm just using centrifugal force just to lengthen the neck of the, of the vessel. And why were they so keen on blowing glass? Well, because uh, the earlier methods were very laborious, which meant that glass took a long time to make into vessels. It was quite a luxury commodity. Uh, but once it could be blown, scores of vessels could be made by a single worker in a day. And suddenly it became an everyday commodity. It could be used for tablewares, containers of all sorts. And practically every Roman site you excavate, you find some fragments of glass on it. I'm just uh, flaring the lip out slightly now, just prior to putting the trail on. Trail it round, trail slowly first, create the thick collar. It's such a sort of beautiful, gentle process, isn't yeah. it? You have to work with the glass. Uh, if it's too hot, it's too runny and uh, things get out of control. And if it's too cool, then it's, it just stiffens up too much and you just can't do anything with it, really. Oh. And I just use a, a stick just to uh, put a fold in the top of the handle and open out the handle and shape it. That is absolutely incredible, Mark. <laughs> By the start of our last day, it looks as if we've got a third grave in the hotel lawn. But what do these burials tell us? Margaret thinks the first body is that of a woman, and Phil's is the skeleton of a child. So can we tell if our Roman child is a boy or a girl, or why it died so young? Across the river in the incident room, Peter Jones is taking material from one of the tiny teeth. He's prepared to try and get a DNA profile for us in about four hours, the first time this has been done on Time Team. There's a tantalising curve in Trench 2. If this is the foundation, then Nick's pretty sure the building is circular. There's also no shortage of finds to indicate wealth. And we've got some lovely finds from this trench. Um, here we have, for example, a bronze fingering in the form of a key, and that would have been used for opening a jewellery box. Now, does that mean that that jewellery box might have been here as well? Well, there's certainly some graves from York which have produced jewellery boxes actually in the grave as grave goods. And you seem to have some rather nice-looking wall plaster here. We've got a lot of wall plaster coming out of that trench and quite a number of colours. We've got blue and red and we also have green and we have quite some really big pieces with sort of yellow patterns and they're actually beginning to find ochre in the, in the spoil heap now. Excellent. What else have you got? Well, the most exciting thing as far as I'm concerned, and this is in pieces, so I'm a bit nervous about picking it up, is this ivory lid, the bung for a pot like that which would have held perfumed oils. And why would they have had oil there? Well, as part of the ritual of actually burying somebody, you would anoint them with perfumed oils. We're going to lift the skull, aren't we, Margaret? We are. How are we going to do this? Well, if I pick it up very carefully and bring it round to you... That looks so fragile. I know. It is fragile. Yeah, if it's about to collapse. Oh, well. oh, we've lost okay. the jawbone. Is that yeah, all right? that's fine. We did that deliberately. Oh, OK. Uh, I hope you can see that on camera. I don't think we dare hold it for too long. No. Shall we just get it yeah. back into this box? Now, what do we know about her? Well, she's over 30, yeah. she's childless, and she probably had backache. <sighs> 
And what are we going to do with the bones? Well, we'll take them back to the laboratory for full analysis and then we'll bring them back to York to go in the museum in their store. And what's happening over here? Well, this one's great. We've got a superb skeleton. It's a young adult male who died aged between 20 and 25. We've got um, evidence that he was buried wearing his hobnail boots, which is quite nice. But even more unusual, we've got evidence that a feast was prepared for him to take on his journey to the underworld. Phil, what have you been doing up your end of the trench? Well, I'm absolutely absorbed here, Tony. I mean, we've just got to that critical bit where you're clearing out around the ribs, and they are just so, so delicate. I mean, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time with this, with this poor little infant, four years old, and what, who died in 250 AD or thereabouts, and the only thing I still don't know is what sex it is. Paul, can you hear me? Have you got any news on the DNA? Tony, I've got a result for you, okay? I can definitely confirm that the first skeleton that was uncovered was definitely female. She's also been tested for TB and no TB was found. The juvenile that you were just talking to Phil about that was next door to her, that was definitely a girl. Your one is a little girl. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, here I am, I've done, oh, I don't know how many skeletons. It's the first time I've ever got the sex determined actually on site before the bones are taken out. It's incredible. But we're still trying to get to grips with this building. And if it is circular, based on Bernard's survey, it could be anything between 10 and 20 metres in diameter. The more Nick and his team dig down, the better the finds that are coming out. It's enormous. You're going right the way down, probably, what, over a metre, and right at the bottom there, we've actually got the wall foundations. Of what? Of an enormous building. Oh, Look, let me take you from the top down. Yeah. We've got Yorkstone roof tiles from Leeds, from the Leeds yeah. area. We've also got ceramic roof tiles, so it would have been a quite an extensive roof. We've got walls that are very heavily plastered. And this is all Roman? It is all Roman. And right down on the floor, we've got an, a concrete Opus Signinum actual floor with very likely wow. a mosaic floor on it. Victor, you can you come in here? Let's have a look and see. This is what we think then that it might have looked like. I think what you've got here is this enormous mausoleum. What, 20 metres in diameter? Concrete floor, plastered walls, domed roof, possibly a mosaic in the middle. Now, who is in here? I mean, I, I, I like to speculate, but go we'll on, speculate. Go on, have a go. Who do you think might be well, here? Two, two emperors died in York, Septimius Severus and Constantius Chlorus. We know that Severus was taken elsewhere, but I'm not sure what happened to Chlorus. The second site in our three-day live excavation in York was established by Viking invaders in the 9th century. They called their settlement Jorvik, and close to the River Foss, on an ancient street still called Warmgate, we're hoping to find evidence of inhabitation. The city's famous for its Viking archaeology, as timbers and domestic remains have been discovered, preserved for over a thousand years in the wet conditions below ground. Carenza's working with Viking expert Patrick Ottaway, who excavated the world-famous Coppergate site very close to here. They're joined by our very own Viking presenter, and no stranger to time team, Sandy Toxvig. Carenza, I have just discovered the most fantastic use of myself as an archaeological device. Oh, now, really? yeah, I am exactly five foot tall, so I can tell you that is precisely how far down we've dug so far. I'm sure we'll be able to make better use of you over the weekend. <laughs> I hope though. So. Now, what, what have we discovered so far? Well, we're down with the Viking layers here, we're pretty sure, and because it's wet, we're getting really good preservation, like we hoped, and we've got timbers turning up. Brilliant. But I tell you something I'm really excited about, I'm really, really excited. You see there's a sort of dark, ashy layer in there. Yeah. In fact, if you look at that bit of wood in particular, you can see it's light brown at the bottom, but black at the top, that's been burnt. And there is historical evidence in, I think, Doomsday Book that tells us when the Normans took over the Viking city they burned a lot of it down oh the rotters <laughs> <laughs> this might be that fire at Warmgate we're also going to be concentrating on environmental archaeology Andrew Jones and his team are searching for tiny items such as food particles seeds and insects things that could tell us more about everyday Viking life in Jorvik 
tell us, what are you up to here, Andrew? Well, what we're doing is we're sorting through a sample of soil that we sieved earlier. And this is the kind of thing we've got, little fragments of glass here. Um, a lot of this is modern, but mixed in with it are quite a lot of bone fragments. And some of these are quite interesting. For example, that one there, that's a haddock vertebra. That's a herring vertebra. And what that tells you about the diet and the things that them. Precisely, that's what we're doing this work for. We want to find out what people had for their tea, basically. <laughs> there's a, bo a box of rocks there. Oh, no, this isn't rocks. What do you think it might be? Oh, I'm terribly worried it's going to be something slightly unpleasant. It's extremely unpleasant, I'm afraid. That is mineralised human excrement. It's very, very old poo, is it? it? Absolutely, and it's well preserved in these waterlogged deposits. Mick and Mick want to get a date on a wooden post that could have been part of a house. If you cut through my finger, I'll shout, right? OK. Ah, that's going, that's going, look. You're nearly there. This will be taken to Sheffield to be examined by our dendrochronologists, yes. who date timber by tree ring analysis. Oh, look at that. It's at the end of the stake, then, or was it? Yeah, it was. It's like it's chamfered on this one face. Actually, I'm going to have to run off with this. Right, and OK. find some polystyrene and, right. and put it straight into it. Do you want me to hold it while I get no, out I'm, I'll just, I'm just not going to let go. <laughs> <laughs> Mick hopes that we'll have a date for that timber tomorrow. Warmgate stretches away from the Foss Bridge in the centre. Our site's just by the church. Under these Victorian tiles, there's a thousand years of floor levels piled one on top of another. Five and a half's here, so that's going to be the centre of our new trench. That'll give us the middle of the trench, yes. Post and wattle boundaries were found at the Coppergate excavation. Patrick Ottaway thinks that this street could be just the same. A row of thatched single-storey timber houses would have been put up right along Warmgate, each on a long, narrow plot separated by wattle fences. Traders lived with their rooms opening out onto the street, displaying their wares. But our measurement's not just limited to the site. Stuart's determined to find more evidence in Warmgate itself. And you can see we're in a whole series of property boundaries. One there, there's one there. You can see the whole row of shops are divided up to up there. And what I'm trying to see if there's any common unit of measurement in these boundaries which reflects how they were laid out in the Viking period. Is it the same unit of measurement that we're seeing down there So basically there now? the Vikings had a building plot and then for generation and generation people just kept building in exactly the same That's place. That's absolutely right. If we can take lots of measurements, we should be able to try and either prove it or disprove it. Is it theory or is it evidence? I believe you. Let's go and try. OK. Pull the tape along, keep going, keep going. See so where the paint changes there. Gonna get to there and Take measure. that measurement. Can you read that? That's 3.6 metres. Okay, Robin, so up <laughs> to the end of that building. Right. And how long is that? Can you read it? Three, three metres of red one. Three, halfway between 3.6, 3.7. So what, what sort of measurements are we looking for here? Oh, uh, we know from other excavations in York that properties were set out in perches. So that's a fish that's about that long. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, the tape isn't calibrated in fishes. It's a measurement of 18 feet, which is about five and a half metres. We've got lots to measure, and I need to check all the measurements, and so I think we need to Come back to me it. with the results. OK. <laughs> Come on, team. Come on. Hop over, Katrina. Warmgate was one of many thriving communities in Jorvik, trading with Ireland, Scotland, Scandinavia, and as far away as the Baltic and further east still. The new trench. Anything exciting coming out of that? Yes, yeah, we're still going through medieval layers here. We've hit a sort of sunken feature, might be a pit or a ditch, might be a boundary ditch. Masses of medieval pottery coming out of that, and hopefully some brilliant finds tomorrow, and eventually we'll get down to the Viking layers in it. Well, already we've had some great finds today. I mean, earlier we found that piece of wood, what, potentially a thousand year old bit of Bucket, a bucket yeah, or something? Bucket or a barrel or something, absolutely wonderful. And, I mean, the other the sort of things that are coming out of that Viking trench, the organic preservation, that's a leather strap, a thousand-year-old leather strap. That is fantastic. From someone's, maybe to hold someone's purse onto their belt or keep their shoe done up. By our third day, we've got walls in both trenches, so do we have a house? We also have lots of finds, including leather and food remains. So what was life like a thousand years ago? These houses in the Viking Age here in York are really quite small. They're a few metres wide. Mm -hmm. They have a hearth in the middle, usually. And one big room or, or several rooms? Or what? Well, we usually find these buildings have just one big room, yes, where everything went on all around the central house. 
So they're all living, sleeping, working, everything, all in the same place? That's right, they are, yes, and chucking their rubbish straight out of the back door. You'd have a pig snuffling around eating the rubbish, <laughs> and you'd have cats and dogs and probably a few chickens scrambling around as well. It sounds rather a cosy scene, actually. By the standards of the day, these were good buildings, people had good living conditions, they had a good diet, and um, a good time was had by all. So are we looking at a lot of houses, a kind of suburb of York? I don't think it's a suburb, but I think we're right in the heart of Yorvik here, on one of the great arterial routes into the town. There's Warngate out there, it's one of the most important streets. And you should think of long buildings facing onto the street, end onto the street. This is the typical technique of construction that we know from other sites in York. So, the house walls were constructed out of wattle and post fences and formed single-storey, timber-framed, thatched houses built in rows right along Warmgate. Each house probably belonged to a different trader and his family. A butcher, cobbler, potter, baker or fishmonger. Now, you've been out measuring. What have you gathered from it? Oh, I've had a great time. A whole street and town to play with. <laughs> you with fantastic. Those. Yeah. <laughs> Using the young archaeologists to help me take measurements. Oh, that's good. What we've yeah. found, measured properties and found that up there there's um, a shop called the Three Peas and next to it uh, a kebab house called Alice Kitchen. They're exactly a perch width each. 5.5 metres, 18 feet unit we were looking for. I always find it incredible that things as old as that should still survive in the modern townscape. Yeah. So, I mean, you said to me when we first started looking at this that people were building plots and then building and building and building. Has it proved what you first thought? Oh, exactly. I'm sure if you're standing in Alice's kitchen at the moment, you're standing exactly over yeah. somebody else's kitchen four yeah. metres below yeah. you. Andrew Jones's young archaeologists have sieved, washed and sorted every bucket of material from the two trenches. Nothing can escape their attention. We found this fantastic glass bead here. That is beautiful. And did it come up with a dig or, or how was it found? <laughs> it was found in the sieve from the medieval rubbish pit, but Peter's pretty confident it's actually Viking. Yes, I think it's one of the richest Viking beads we've ever found in York. It's something very special. It's better than anything we've ever seen before. It's really wonderful with these um, blue and white stripes, these lovely little yellow gobs on the end, and these incredible things that are like walnut whips made of blue and white. And is it something that you would typically find in Viking settlements in England, then? Well, uh, it looks like a Viking bead, and we've been looking in these books to see if we can find a parallel. We've, we, we've checked up all the Anglo-Saxon glass beads, no, nothing there. What would it have been used for? Well, I suppose it may have been in a necklace like this. You see, there's one just there, very similar. It's the nearest we've actually found so far. And where does that come from, the nearest one that you well, found? It comes from Reba in Denmark. So it suggests wealth in this area? Oh, definitely. I mean... Top the, of the range. Top the, of the range. Richest kind of bead you can get. An extraordinary craftsman, presumably. The nearest mm. site... I mean, Peter's talking about a site in Ireland now, which is the site of the Irish kings as a possibility. Yes, the great Cranog at Lagor, which is where the Irish kings of Tara used to live. A 9th century craftsman probably traded this bead for jet or amber outside his house here in Warmgate. The Irish merchant ship may well have been moored at the end of the street. You look a bit of young archaeologist. What's your name? Michael. And how old are you, Michael? Six. And what have you been finding? Um, pottery. Yeah? And are you going to be an archaeologist when you grow up? No. Oh, what are you going to be? Footballer. Probably very sensible. Make a lot more money, I'm sure. <laughs> Is there any archaeology in football grounds? Uh, I think there might be a bit. There might be a bit. <laughs> Now, tell me about this. Well, this is um, fragments of amber, which is a resin, um, and that was imported. But you see, that to me is, I mean, as a Dane, that is hugely exciting, because amber, for, for the Scandinavians, has a kind of mystical significance about it. I mean, even today in Denmark, amber is absolutely the jewellery that you're supposed to wear. Yeah, well, we're thrilled, and what this shows is that in these Viking Age levels, people were working in amber. But are we also talking about fairly wealthy people to have amber? I think the indications are that we must have that, and with that be it's beginning to stack up. We've got a couple of other beads that have come out of the ground as well, yeah. With less than two hours left, something else is emerging. I think we should get Sandy to have a look at this, don't I think you? we should, yes. It's very interesting, isn't <laughs> well, it? she's in here shot. Sandy! Sandy! Oh, there you are. I'm hiding. <laughs> Can I come down? Yeah, yes. come down. Come Dude, and have a look at this. What have you got? I think you might find this really fascinating. I think what we've got here is a shoe which has been thrown away in a rubbish pit or in a backyard. Medieval? And, well, I think we're now in deposits which are probably very close to being Viking Age. 
So I think it's a Viking Age shoe. It's your full bears footwear. Doesn't it make you go all goosey? <laughs> Fantastic, yes. So can we talk about the back of somebody's house where they kind of threw out rubbish, is it possible? I'm wondering, I mean, we've got timbers coming through here, which I thought, still think, might be our other property boundary, which would yeah. be at exactly 18 feet. So we've got our perch that we talked about. Well, if that's what it is. My own feeling is that we're probably in backyard mm. here, and it may be that these stones are part of a yard. So a Viking leather shoe comes out of the ground after 900 years with the stitching holes still visible. It could well have been made here in Warmgate, sold to a fellow trader or his wife and worn tramping the streets of Jorvik. The time team leave, what's going to happen to the site? Well what we hope is that we've now seen the potential of this site. We now know how important it is, that how well preserved the deposits not only of the Viking Age but of the medieval period are. Mm -hmm. And we hope obviously we can do an enormous amount of further excavation here mm -hmm. to fully understand how this site has developed and the lifestyle of people in York through the last millennium. Three years after the Norman invasion of 1066, William the Conqueror arrived in York. He built two castles to defend the rivers and began to build the minster which still dominates the city. Just a few minutes' walk from the great church stood St Leonard's, the largest medieval hospital in England. St Leonard's covered an area of five acres between the Minster and the river. Very little remains today, as the original precinct is almost completely built over. But in the shadow of the Roman multi-angular tower, we'll begin our three-day live investigation. At the other end of this lawn is a vital clue, a vaulted building which we think was part of a monastic refectory. As usual, we start with the geophysics. Well, that's very colourful, John, but what does it mean? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> this is the magnetic plot. Right. We've done resistance and radar, and we're still looking at the results. But at the moment, we, I mean, we've got this huge anomaly, and it's running right through the centre of so the was grid. That right up the middle of this grass and through yeah, the flower beds? Through the flower beds, beyond the roses. Big linear anomaly. So is, is, this, is this a big medieval wall that we're looking at? Uh, no, no, it, it looks almost modern. It, it, brick. Brick? Uh, possibly culvert, or, uh, pipe, I don't know. It doesn't sound medieval or monastic, it does it? Yeah. But then we've got this big response as well. That's over in front of us. There. Now, whether it's connected... Well, the obvious thing is to put a trench that cuts both of those, isn't it, Barney? Yeah. So somewhere, somewhere across yeah. in yeah. this area here, uh, if we can put something that will hit both, you know, then um, we'll have a look see what it is. Well, I look forward to seeing. <laughs> what sort of size are you thinking of for that? Three by two, something yeah. like that. Okay. We're pretty sure there's a hospital under here somewhere, so the diggers get straight to work. And after several hours, the first structure emerges. But it's clearly not medieval. This is a typical time team start, isn't it? <laughs> well, the locals tell us there was an air raid shelter here, so it could well be bits of an air raid shelter. Well, that's great, isn't it? You must be over the moon. Well, yeah, but it's OK, because it's another bit of York's archaeology. It's the most recent period, so we shall treat it like the rest of the archaeology. So you're not prepared to accept that this is just a load of old modern rubbish? No, no, we shall take it apart and look at it and, and before we go down into the hospital. We're digging where we think the infirmary should have been. Carol, what sort of things would have been happening here? Well, care for the body and medicine for the soul. Medicine for the soul begins in the hospital church, which is to the north of here. And attached to that, there's a dormitory for the, for the brothers and a cloister where they can read and contemplate. And then down here, you've got this huge infirmary for over 200 patients, which is an enormous number. Yeah. You've got an orphanage for the sick children, and they actually have cows to give them milk, which is a nice touch, isn't it? And then on top of all this, you've got this infrastructure of service buildings, kitchen, brewery, granaries, all sorts of buildings to keep the place going. And then really important, the water system and the drainage, because you've got to keep clean. In the incident room, Ray San and architectural historian Beryl Lott have started to make a 3D reconstruction of the medieval hospital using old maps and drawings, which will be backed up with measurements from our excavation. In the 1300s, we think the hospital precinct looked like this. 
with the infirmary somewhere in this area. Above St Leonard's Place, built in 1832, are some of the earliest buildings which still exist inside the Theatre Royal. The main wall behind the stage was once a defended 13th century gateway and the arches in one of the newly restored reception rooms form an undercroft that looks like the one on the lawn. This is a, a detailed street plan of York in 1610 and we've blown it up so that here you can see the hospital precinct with the multi-angular tower and all these buildings tucked inside which we may come across. Moving on, in 1777, we've got again the, the tower and the city walls, more buildings that still survived at that date, possibly reused from monastic times. And this great big map uh, here? Finally, well, this is a good bit of York street planning in 1832. Here's St. Leonard's Place coming in, and here again is our multi angular tower with more buildings that may conceivably come down to us from medieval times, and where we're digging Mrs. Sampson's stable yard. <laughs> Thank you. All this talk of hospitals is getting to Paul Thompson. Well, Carol, I'm feeling none too well, and it's the 13th century, so I crawl to hospital. Is it just like arriving at casualty? No, you've got to forget any idea about a resemblance with a modern hospital. It's completely different. None of the high-tech stuff at all. The first thing you do when you arrive is confess your sins, so your soul's healthy. Then they take you into the open ward and they make you comfortable. You're in bed, you're clean, and you've got nourishing food, and that is part of your therapy. Well, I'm desperately poor and I'm desperately ill, so that's already going to make me feel a lot better better. But what is there for me in terms of treatment and medicine? Well this of course is an age before antibiotics and antisepsis and most of the medicine that's available for the sick poor is herbal. Now the nurses at St Leonard's were very skilled herbalists and they grew a lot of the produce themselves. Well this is all looking very impressive but look I've got terrible ulcerated weeping sores. What can you do for me? Oh, I've just got, I've got just the thing. This is Plaster Bartholomew. It's yeah. plantain parsley honey and flour. Which is antiseptic, of course. Right, so that goes on to here, and that's a sort of a poultice bandage. Mm, yeah, I think that would probably do the trick. So my wounds are de dealt with, but I've got terrible toothache, awful, awful toothache. What Just you got the for thing me? here, this is sage and salt tooth wash, which helps to keep your teeth white and mm. also has antiseptic. Wow, that is, that's very strong, but it's very scented as well. Very yeah, strong. smell is very important oh. in medieval therapy. It goes right to your vital spirits, you see, and hospital mm. wards were often actually perfumed. That's a bit better. I feel my Isn't senses it? are lifting here, but my toothache's getting worse, well, honestly. You try this as mint, wine and vinegar. This is like a gargle. So this is a gargle, not to be um, drunk, though. No. Well, just gargle it round and then see what you think. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely disgusting. Well, I'm sorry, but the oh. next step is to pack your tooth with raven's dung, which would start to rot your tooth out. I don't know which you. of those sounds worse, to be oh, honest with you. If you've still got pain, then you heat this needle red hot, put it down here, which aims it into the tooth, and it'll burn the nerve out. Rather him than me. Well, we've achieved what the Luftwaffe never did, a direct hit on an air raid shelter in York. It's totally collapsed, so Mick and Barney will record it and shut down Trench 1 completely. We've actually extended this trench now away from the air aid shelter to try and take in some of the medieval material that goes to the hospital. So we're pursuing that at the moment. And uh, any relationship with our geophys? Well, the yeah. geophys is great, isn't it? We've now got the resistance and the radar results we didn't have this morning. And the shallow resistance is showing this nice spread of rubble here. And as we go deeper into the ground, it appears we might have two blobs. Now, these might just be piers. If we look at the, like. the radar, <laughs> We can see them quite clearly here. One, two, about four metres yeah. apart. Where do we think those piers might be? Under us here. That hat, we think, <laughs> marks one of them. <laughs> and what might the significance of piers well, be? Well, if we, if we find one of the piers intact, it shows that there's medieval masonry of the hospital left. So that'd be great. But in order to get further than that, we need to find two of them. So we think there's one here and one over here. Because if we get two, that gives us some of the dimensions of the bays or the width between the main pillars in the building. We can start to do a reconstruction. It doesn't look as if St Leonard's is going to throw up its remains that easily. The hunt's on for two or even three pillar bases where we think the infirmary should have been. The measurement between the columns should give Ray San and Beryl the information they need to scale the height of the building. That's if Geophys have got it right. 
You literally can get a picture on a computer of what it looks like. So that's why they chose this area. And what they found hmm. over in there... It makes it all sound so easy. But Barney is onto something. Come and see this, Mick. It's absolutely brilliant. Is it what we wanted? It is absolutely what oh, we wanted. Oh, wow, look at that. Gold dust. Look. <laughs> look at that. That, that, is, is... that is right just about where the hat was yesterday. That's absolutely right. Absolutely brilliant. Not only that, but the curve of the pier... Can you see the curve of the pier? Yeah. It suggests to me that that is above the medieval ground level. It's still a moulded piece of stone, ah, so right. it's meant so, to be seen. So some way down before we get to the floors. Yeah, so. yeah, that's, that's what I think. Cracking, so that it? means we might get some of the floor surface of the hospital itself. Well, that's brilliant, isn't it? Patients coming to the gates of this hospital in medieval York would have received all forms of treatment, some of it none too pleasant. Carol, why this mad obsession with bloodletting? It's not a mad obsession to them. It's based on solid scientific theory. Right. You see, the blood is believed to carry four humours. Mm -hmm. Sanguine, me melancholic, choleric and phlegmatic. Yeah. And if you have too much of any of them, they make you sick. Right. So the idea is to bleed it off and then restore the balance. Well, my humours are pretty balanced, aren't they, really? Well, you look a shade too sanguine to me, <laughs> at least <laughs> so far in that. the programme. <laughs> you see, this is what a barber surgeon, actually a York barber surgeon, would do. Please this is his chart. Foot the fingerprints on it. Yes, it's, it's used, thing. it's used. And these show where you would be bled depending on what was wrong with you. Well, I certainly don't want any blood taken from round here. I'm, I'm not very keen on that idea at all, actually, Carol, I have to say. <laughs> well, for a delicate little plant like you, we can arrange something else. Meet a leech. Yeah, that's a leech, fine. What are you going to do with it? It's a specialist of medical leech, and it's going on you. It's very hungry. Come on, hold your arm. Hold your arm. Oh, there that's revolting. <laughs> no. <laughs> There it is. There How go. long does this thing have to stay It'll on before? It'll stay on for at least 15 minutes once it attaches. Ugh. I feel sorry for the leech. Still, at least Paul's got the evening to get over it. At last, more pillar bases are emerging in the trench, together with what could be the infirmary floor. Victor's taking advantage of the morning light. I'm sure I've seen those patients before somewhere. It wasn't so easy being a medieval in York. I think life for the everyday person living in York in the 11th, 12th, 13th centuries would have been pretty hard, actually, yes. Imagine nights without light, candles only. Imagine streets probably covered in mud, just over basic cobbled surfaces. You know, you would have to buy food every day. No chance of storing it, whatever. It's a, it's a pretty sort of hard existence in many ways. Religion was hugely important in daily life. The church really controlled society to a very large extent because they held the keys to the afterlife. And I think to the medieval individual, that thought of not making it to heaven was hugely frightening, you know, burning in the fires of hell. Our major challenge up here was to find out just what this huge infirmary building looked like. So, how do you reckon we've done? Oh, I think we've done fantastically because we've now got this row of pillar bases which enables us to reconstruct what the thing looked like. So, we've got one pillar base over there where Katie we've is. We've got one in the middle, yeah. which is a, a, a column top. We've got a huge foundation base here which should have had a, a column coming up from it. And the third one is just appearing in the far trench. Now, hold on. This one here at our feet doesn't look at all like the thing that Case has been executed. No, bec because this is lower down and they've dug a big hole and put the foundations in and then later on everybody's sort of taken the stone away and reused it elsewhere when the hospital was finished. This is what we call robbing? Yeah, well, it's robbing, but as you said earlier, it's recycling of the stone really for other buildings. Good practice. Yeah. So, so what have we been able to tell by the fact that we've got all these? Well, the fact we've got three shows us the interval of the pillars in probably an undercraft, undercroft, rather like we've got over the back there. This thing here that yeah, still exists. That still exists, which is the later one. But because we've got those intervals, we know how far away the wall was and indeed where the other columns are in the site. What about dating, Beryl? Well, apart from the fact that this enormous plinth tells us that it was actually Norman and slightly earlier than the undercroft that still stands, yeah. then we've also got this pottery. Well, let's have a look at that. What is it? It's green glazed medieval ware. It's very similar to a, a type called Scarborough ware and it's very, very rough and it makes a huge pot. Vessels such as this could have been used for carrying water up and down the wards. 
But back in the incident room, have Ray San and Beryl finished our 3D reconstruction? We can tell that we've got these two large hospital buildings which would have held the old and the infirm. We also know that we've got the church and the cloistral buildings at the back. We have an outer court which would have held all the stables and the lay sisters. We've got quite a grand entrance down onto the river gate which was actually called the Great Gate by 1430. Briefly Mick, does this help you? I think this is fantastic because we know that these are very irregular collections of buildings. And one, now it's three-dimensional. All the proportions I was worried about earlier, they fit now. And what I think it looks like is a great big institution, which is what it was. Which is what it was. <laughs> yeah. The size and power of St Leonard's Hospital reflected the importance of York in the development of Britain, a place that the Roman Emperor Constantius declared should be the cradle of Christianity. York is such a rich fount of English history. I thought it was going to be impossible to add anything significant to what we know of the place in this little time, but I think now that I was wrong. I think that we've thrown a few shafts of light onto a few moments of that history, and I hope you agree. Well done, everybody. A great three days. Cheers. You can join the Ghost Hunters on Civilization next. Here on Discovery Channel, though, Jesse thinks they can turn a Chevy into a wedding chapel, with him acting as minister. Monster Garage, after the break.